Well, hello everyone and uh, our Baroque lectures. And today we're going to France. Well, in a matter of speaking, we are going to be looking at the French artists, most of whom spent most of their lives, particularly their creative lives, in Italy. And we thus begin with uh, Nicolas Poussin. He is the exact opposite of Rubens in terms of uh, visual effect. Perhaps not in his discipline, but in terms of his visual effect, definitely. Um, he uh, will also look very differently in discipline, even though Rubens, when we talked about Rubens, I did mention the fact that even though he seemed immoderate, he was really never undisciplined. But in terms of Poussin, there is no contradiction in the first place. You can see the discipline from the very beginning. In fact, so different they were that the French Academy, for the longest time, will be divided between the Rubinists and the Poussinists. And here we have, um, born in Normandy, I think, in the north of France, and may have been born to a family of peasants. But there was something in this boy that he needed to run away, and run away he did. Came to Paris, apprenticed himself somewhere, didn't work out, uh, uh, asked his parents for help, went back home, then left again. Ultimately he found himself to Rome, and in Rome he stayed. And in Rome he became extremely famous, famous throughout Europe. He will go back to Paris on the request of uh, the French king, Louis XIV, will hate everything there, run away back to Rome, and in Rome he'll continue to be. And uh, we begin with a painting called uh, In Arcadio Ego, which is very characteristic. He, um, what will happen with Poussin, you see, is that he will ultimately develop this theory no doubt influenced by Rome, by classical Rome, and by Rome's ultimate love and being in love with everything Greek and with Greek rationality, Greek classical rationality. He will ultimately develop a theory that men's intellectual authority must imprint itself on unruly nature, because that is the time and the only time when civilization can happen. And as such, for him, intellect in art will be crystallized, in a way, to a supreme detachment. This painting illustrates uh, one of the passages in um, Virgil's Eclogues that talks about some shepherds uh, finding a tomb in Arcadia. Now, Arcadia, in reality, is a, a region in Greece which is very wild, very mountainous, not green at all, but with time and because of uh, Virgil also, it came to be looked at as the golden age of humanity, as uh, a golden age of harmony and beauty before before decadence ensued. And thus, Vir Virgil's Eclogues, we have here uh, three presumably peasants with, uh, with a woman and they come upon a sarcophagus and on it, it uh, essentially, uh, it is a, a memento mori right there. And what they read here is uh, at in Arcadia ego, in other words, interpreted as I am death and even in Arcadia, even in paradise, I exist. And not only they are interpreting, they are reading that, one of them, but they all, it also is um, meant to be this story as the origin of painting because as uh, this man casts a shadow on this monument, on this momento mori, the, the uh, remembrance of death, he also recognizes his own mortality and 
the fact that by delineating his cast shadow, that is one of the ways of leaving for future generations his image. And as such, art becomes the keeper of memories. Art becomes the keeper, in fact, of uh, immortality. The, um, the woman here is, uh, is taken from this Juno Sessi, which is a 2nd century BC uh, uh, sculpture and she she provides uh, also a type of immortality she looks like a goddess and of course the statue is that of a goddess or another immortal Greek uh, woman and so her immortality is then uh, juxtaposed against the mortality of others now the the, the, the whole thing is extremely carefully composed. It is composed in sort of in a circle around the tomb right there and the shepherd's hole there, shepherd's crooks in sort of in a, in, in a V position. And uh, as you see here, not only it can be inscribed by uh, or described by a circle, but it also fits perfectly within this uh, rectangle. So the, it, it creates a meticulous, very balanced pattern around the tomb. At this point, Poussin will embrace Stoicism, which was a Greek philosophy developed in the 4th century BC, but which was extremely popular among Roman upper classes. And um, it had many tenets, one of which is a quiet resignation to, to one's fate, and this is what this is about. Uh, it is a beautiful landscape, it's an Italian landscape, where one just wishes to live forever, but one must be reconciled to the fact of death, because, well, we all have to. And here is... Uh, the painting of that, of having to reconcile oneself to the fact. And so it's, it's, a, it's a double uh, entente in, in, in a way that on the one hand we have to reconcile ourselves to death, we meet with it even in paradise essentially, and yet art is there, this is how art began, and, and art is our insurance against mortality whether it is painting or whether it is sculpture. And even the colors here, there's so many, there's the blue, uh, red, yellow. These are the colors that uh, immediately strike us, and those are prime colors. And uh, Poussin was uh, very aware of this, uh, of this as well, of, uh, and, and, and putting those, those prime colors uh, there. Here it is, and um, together with his, um, embrace of Stoicism and his embrace of uh, uh, classical values and Greek values, he also very much embraced the idea of a golden rectangle. And we see the proportion of a golden rectangle. It's 1.618. Uh, it, it is essentially, here, it is the ratio of the longer side of a rectangle of a golden rectangle to a shorter side of a rectangle. And one of its properties is if, if a square is cut out of a golden rectangle, the other rectangle that appears on the other side will still be a golden rectangle. And it is very well exemplified uh, with the Athenian Parthenon, which also was constructed according to the golden rectangle. And here you can see it and you'll see it even bet better uh, in your PowerPoints. Here is the same. And, uh, and in fact, the golden rectangle is found everywhere in nature, not to mention the uh, celestial spheres. And uh, as such, while it's not exemplified here, but he, uh, uh, he organized his canvases very carefully according to these, to these classical proportions. Another uh, painting of his is uh, that of Midas and Bacchus, and the story here 
is that uh, Midas, who was a king of Lydia and quite greedy, uh, but he did a favor for, for Bacchus. So Bacchus essentially told him, ask anything you want, you'll have it. <laughs> At which point Midas asked that anything he touches would turn to gold. Uh, that was his first reaction without realizing that the food he touches will turn to gold as well and will become inedible. Uh, so Poussin is uh, now painting uh, this image where Midas is repentant here. He is, uh, his uh, uh, right, right hand is at his chest and he's begging for Bacchus to reverse uh, the, uh, the promise. And Bacchus essentially tells him, well, yes, you can do it. You must go to a certain river. You have to wash in that river. And then the, uh, the curse, the, as it became, will become lifted. And that's, uh, that's the theme of the painting. And what we see here, again, is um, it can certainly be divided like this very rationally and also without question according to the golden ratio as well. But we also see circles here. Another thing we should never forget is that uh, he was very much influenced by Titian, but even more so by Raphael. In, by those two, definitely. He was influenced by Titian and Raphael. And in this case, in fact, what he does, he kind of takes the composition from Titian's The Bacchanal of the, of the Adrians, and it also has to deal with Bacchus, uh, or Dionysus for that matter, and the festival of Dionysus, and those will always be dedicated to, to drinking, to merriment, to having a good time, to, to getting drunk. Um, I don't know if you can see it here together, but you certainly will in your PowerPoint. And uh, so the composition is quite similar. There in Titian lies uh, drunken Silenus, who is companion of Bacchus, and here too it's either drunken Silenus or the river god, because, uh, because Midas had to go and bathe in the river. But it's the same thing, and uh, divided, well, Titian has these uh, beautiful blue sky on, uh, on the right of the painting, whereas Poussin introduces darker clouds, but otherwise everything takes place in the shadow of the corpse right there. And while uh, Titian has his nude, we don't know who that nude is, whether she's just sleeping and dreaming this whole thing up or she had too much to drink, uh, but uh, Poussa introduces a very similar nude. Not identical, but a very similar nude. Meanwhile, around they're older, they're older people and younger people and a goat, which a goat's sacrificial cry was the name for tragedy originally. But in the center stands the beautiful, uh, beautiful figure, classical figure of Bacchus with the repentant Midas. And uh, here too, everything is just brilliantly organized. Uh, his, um, his triumph of Neptune and uh, Amphitrite, uh, Neptune and Amphitrite, the husband and wife, Neptune wooed Amphitrite, she came to him, then at some point she left, then he wooed her again, then she returned, and this is one of these uh, uh, moments when, when she's returning. Here we have a beautiful uh, male form of Neptune, almost Greek, in his chariot that's driven by horses, and Amphitrite in hers that's driven by dolphins. And in this case, if you took the composition before from Titian, this one is, in fact, taken from Raphael. Here is a very famous fresco by Raphael that lives in Villa Farnesina in Rome. And uh, this is the triumph of Galatea, where she is in, uh, in a shell driven by dolphins. Raphael very much liked to compose his paintings according to an eight-figure composition. In other words, when you look at this painting, you can see that the lower portion forms a larger circle and the upper portion forms a smaller circle. And sort of together they, they kind of make a figure eight. And Poussin seems to like that and, to adopt, and he adopted this for his own painting. And as a result, here we have our putti right there. And one of them is directing his arrow right at uh, Neptune here. 
and then the uh, the lower portion is um, is a larger circle. And as you see with with this little putty angel, he practically quotes Raphael right there. They're almost identical. It's almost as if he's writing here. Well, and this is my inspiration, in not so many words, but uh, with this with this image. Amphitrite is accompanied by the Nereids. She has a court of Nereids around her, and then Neptune has um, has his Tritons who accompany who accompany him. Uh, and that this composition also is very classical. The brush never shows. In a classical painting, the brush cannot show because uh, Poussin would consider it an undisciplined painting and there was no role for the absence of discipline in his art. Here it is. Uh, also, it's very possible that Amphitrite herself, with, the, uh, with her scarf uh, flowing, flowing around, flowing above her, is also taken from uh, from this image. It's uh, a relief from the altar of peace from the time of Augustus, uh, altar of the Augustan peace, and it was commissioned by the Roman Senate on July 4th, uh, the year 13 BC, to commemorate the peace that has come over Rome under the rule of Augustus. And here is the personification of peace and here are the allegories, one of air, one of sea, but, uh, but the whole attitude of, um, uh, of a dignified matron uh, is very Roman and uh, it's very possible that Poussin also looked at that in painting this picture. And now we go to still another of his, um, of his uh, canvases that became just extremely Famous, and uh, this is the death of Germanicus. Germanicus was an older brother of uh, Claudius, who will become Emperor Claudius, uh, and uh, the hero of I, Claudius. Uh, he uh, was a great warrior. He uh, fought many battles in Germany, which is where he got his nickname, Germanicus. And then he was sent to Syria to govern that province for Tiberius, because emperor at the time was Tiberius, uh, the story goes that Tiberius was jealous of him, that Tiberius w feared him, he saw him as competition, and that he had him poisoned. And this is the theme of this painting. This became a prototype for endless, endless death scenes, because what Poussin does here he, um, he's kind of teaching um, a moral lesson in Stoic heroism. Um, he shows the Germanicus lying here. He's not quite dead yet. And he exerted a promise from his wife, from his uh, soldiers, to avenge his death, not that any exertion was needed. Oh, what, what, what's shown here is incredible loyalty. And what's also shown here is the restraint and dignity of the soldiers and, and, and the, uh, the expression on their faces varies from face to face. Here is Agrippina the Elder with a little Caligula, but here is Agrippina the Elder who is mourning the, uh, his death. And so many themes are expressed here, themes of death, of suffering, of injustice, of, of grief, of loyalty, of revenge. It's all there. There's a, and there's a full range of human emotions confronting us. And as I said, this will be uh, the model for just countless other death scenes and the, uh, the dignity and uh, self-containment of these figures. And, uh, he probably was also looking at the Roman sarcophagi. And here, for instance, this is a 4th century Roman sarcophagus. Uh, in the 2nd century AD, for whatever reason, uh, inhumation became popular in, um, in the Roman Empire as opposed to cremation. And inhumation, of course, required coffins. And so very many marble sarcophagi were produced in the 
two last centuries of the um, of the Roman Empire, and uh, they were carved with reliefs expressing whether mythological scenes or scenes from the life of the person who is buried there. So here they are, and many of them, very many of them, survived, and in fact became became models not only for Renaissance painters but also for later painters, as in our case, 17th century. And everything is projected in, in, high, in high relief. And um, it's a frieze-like composition, which also, of course, harkens back both to Greece and Rome in terms of friezes. And then, uh, and also to Renaissance, because here we see this perfect one-point perspective that, of course, uh, Poussin mastered uh, when uh, later, when Jacques Louis David will come to Rome, Poussin will be, uh, his art will be his master. And David springs directly from, from Poussin. Um, the colors here too, he, he just loved the primary colors. It's almost as if he felt that all inquiry must go to its original principles. And that goes for art as well. And here too we see the red, yellow, and blue. The original principles, not only of art, but also of morality, of rectitude, of nobility, of honor. Everything is in this painting. Uh, interestingly also, uh, as I said, little Caligulus is here. And uh, he will not be an example of either of any of those. The integrity, honor, decency. But he was Germanicus' son, and so Poussin includes him as well. Still another of Poussin paintings is the Judgment of Solomon, and here you actually see the division. Here you can visually see the geometry of the painting. It's established immediately with the door on the right, with the door on the left, the two columns on each side of Solomon. Solomon sits in the middle on, uh, on a raised throne with almost a halo around him, uh, just showing that he is the judge, he is the master, he, he also is um, an allegory of justice, which is very important. Two women, the judgment of Solomon, two women come to Solomon, both women birthed a boy, then the boys got confused, one boy died, both claim the living boy to herself and uh, so they, they both of them come to Solomon to decide uh, which one is which and uh, Solomon's judgment is to split the boy in two to which one woman agrees and the other is absolutely horrified no no just give it to the other woman you cannot kill the child and then Solomon knows who the real mother is so, and here he represents the two mothers one with the dead child in her, uh, in her arms. He represents her bluish, angry, uh, almost beastly looking, uh, extending her arm as if in accusation, whereas the other woman is just full of tragedy. Her arms are uh, stretched. Uh, there's a soldier right here, a very heroic looking soldier, with uh, a baby in his uh, in his left hand and a sword drawn about to cut the baby in half as the woman is just screaming to stop this and to stop the uh, the execution essentially and in this case as you see Solomon's hands almost work as a balance of justice and we see so often those uh, plates of the balance of justice uh, that are emblems of, uh, of our legal system and that's how his hands here are acting and his finger definitely points at the woman who is willing to give away the child because she is the, uh, the true mother. So this is our triangular sort of Raphaelite composition. Here it is, right there, and then on each side very symmetrically we see groups of people that make the composition work. He also, he loved landscape, but not landscape for its own sake. He had two loves, landscape definitely, and but also love of 
antique virtue as he understood it. And in this case, this painting is called the funeral of um, Phocion. He found the story in Plutarch. Plutarch writes about one Phocion who lived in uh, Periclean Athens in the uh, so-called democracy. But Phocion was horrified by what was done in the name of democracy and wished to speak his mind and spoke his mind. And as a result, he was condemned to death and to drinking hemlock, as uh, Socrates will be. And not only that, he was also not allowed to be buried in Athens, which was a great dishonor. And therefore, here we have two men, two servants. Uh, there's no one else accompanying them. And they are bringing Phocion out of Athens. In the back here is an imaginary landscape, which is just phenomenally organized again. And we see within that landscape there is a, a group of Athenians that are uh, going to the temple. Life goes on as if nothing had happened. The landscape itself is very complex. And uh, by placing tragic figures in front of it, he makes it all the more evocative and all the more interesting. But then also everything is organized so beautifully that we are in fact contemplating a perfect scenery. But this perfect scenery also tells us a frequent tale of, uh, of human life uh, when the best people are hate hated and, um, and dishonored and um, the world just uh, uh, go on, even no one pays attention. Uh, that here was someone who was excellent, who suffered a very unjust death. Um, the world is uh, almost intentionally ignorant of what is done in the name of civilization, and yet civilization it is, and for civilization one must, must strive. Nothing is easy, nothing is uncomplicated, and that is what Poussin is attempting to show here. The landscape is so rational, so beautiful, and uh, just as I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture, uh, it does show uh, the, the painter's desire uh, to, uh, to supersede uh, his intellectual authority to uh, stamp man's, his intellectual authority onto unruly nature. And uh, in this case, he succeeds with nature itself, with the vista that uh, we are seeing. But of course, it is impossible with human emotions. And it is impossible with human injustice. And all of it is uh, uh, in this painting. And as such, it is fascinating. And here is another landscape of unparalleled splendor. And in the front uh, sits St. Matthew and the Angel. And the painting is called Landscape with St. Matthew and the Angel. They are sitting in the middle of the ruins of the Roman Empire. You see the fallen columns right here. In the background you see uh, a tower that is dilapidated. Uh, the life, nevertheless, goes on, promise goes on. St. Matthew is one of the evangelists, one of the four evangelists, and uh, he is helped with his work by an angel here. The angel appeared to him, as I said, in front of this spectacular, remarkable landscape, and the two of them are essentially composing the happiness for mankind after the fall of the Roman Empire. And uh, it's just so intellectually satisfying, the uh, Poussin's painting, because it is intellectualized art, uh, classicizing art, the art of uh, supreme detachment. But at the same time, that personal detachment makes it also universal. And um, he, uh, Poussin, will certainly become the father of future generations of uh, French classicists. 
Here is, uh, so this is Poussin's, uh, St. Matthew and the Angel, and this you remember. This is Guido Reni and this is Caravaggio, both very personal. There is no detachment there, but there is here by opening up this amazing universal vista to us. And thus we go to our uh, next painter, also French, uh, born in Lorraine now, which was an independent duchy, but uh, usually he's called Claude, but he's called Claude Lorraine because he is uh, from Lorraine. And interestingly enough, where Poussin was epic, here Claude Lorraine will become lyric. He will end up in Italy and in uh, Naples, most particularly. It seems he did not really have uh, social graces. It seems he could barely read and write his native French, let alone uh, his adopted Italian, and that his speech will be, uh, will be rather a mix of French and Italian. And despite his growing reputation, and his reputation will grow tremendously, and, um, and his increased wealth, he will become a very wealthy man. He will always be awkward in uh, very erudite uh, companies, uh, in, whether in Naples or, or in Rome. But his reputation will not suffer for that. He um, realized that landscape can convey poetry, lyric poetry, because until then landscape was not really that until him or Poussin. I mean, Michelangelo couldn't care less about landscape. Uh, you, you barely see any, uh, any nature in, in his frescoes. And, um, and Leonardo was mostly interested in it for scientific purposes. For Raphael, of course, it was always a beautiful stylized background for his figures. Uh, but Claude did see uh, lovely poetry in, in landscape. Um, he, also, he also realized that this poetry comes from light and atmosphere, that light can in fact dissolve the atmosphere, that light can dissolve form. I suppose the Impressionists in this respect are his um, direct heirs, but that's what he set out to do. He, uh, he is painting the Bay of Naples over and over and over again. And he paints it under the guise of uh, often mythological scenes, just to give it a bit, uh, a bit of a kick, to, uh, to make it m interesting not only from the point of view of luminosity, or luminism as it will be called actually in uh, 19th century Hudson River School, but, uh, and, and, and they loved Claude, the Hudson River, school of painters, uh, Claude will be their god, because, and you can see why, because uh, he, uh, he turns atmosphere into something metaphysical, into something transfixed, the way he connects water and sky, uh, ripples and clouds. In this case, uh, this is just named a seaport, and you see 17th century ships, you see a port here, with uh, mostly classical architecture. The sun seems to be setting and, uh, and as such is casting its light over the rippling waves. Uh, here in the front uh, are his contemporaries uh, walking around the shore, discussing, enjoying, enjoying the scene. But what he does here, as I said, he dissolves the atmosphere with light. He penetrates it with light and the light comes from beyond the painting. The light thanks to which we see the painting is provided for us by the sun itself. Here's still another and this looks like early morning and in this case he just he calls it departure of Ulysses from the land of um, Fiacci. Uh, it's the same principle we do not see the sun here. There's a rather sharp division between uh, water and, uh, and sky, classical architecture again. On the right, needless to say, Ulysses did not travel in 17th century ships, which we see here, but he does give the protagonist, at least these protagonists, somewhat of um, Grecian manner of dressing. 
he will admit himself that he was not very strong with figures and uh, he'll he'll try to to draw figures but uh, that uh, that was not his forte and he knew it and as a result the figures are just little pieces of color to enliven the landscape as you see it here beautiful again the rippling water and it's the atmosphere that uh, that made him so tremendously famous and uh, made him so remarkable a painter still another embarkation that one was departure of Ulysses this is the embarkation of the Queen of Sheba we actually seem to uh, to be confront confronted with similar very similar porches this is the Tower of Naples uh, Corinthian columns here and uh, the Queen of Sheba again the ships are 17th century ships he is known usually he is called Claude rather than Claude Lorraine and uh, the future generations of nature painters will uh, study him over and over and over again and, and as I said he'll be uh, tremendously important for the luminous painters of 19th century America. The expulsion of, uh, of Hagar, now the, he goes now to the Old Testament but this also is simply an excuse to paint another glorious, remarkable landscape. And we now arrive at uh, the three brothers Leonard. We don't exactly know, they always signed their, uh, their canvases with their last name, so we really don't know which one is which, but it seems that the, uh, the most uh, talented of them all was Louis. Antoine seems to have specialized in little miniature portraits, and then uh, Matthew in portraits. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, they all work together. I think, in fact, the difference between, uh, between Lewis and Matthew was quite considerable. At some point, uh, there was something like 20 year difference, but, but the, uh, the three brothers were always very close. Uh, I picked this painting of uh, the, uh, the card players, uh, trick players, just uh, uh, to exemplify what the brothers may have looked like. For, for all we know, they may have used uh, their own um, faces for, for this painting. Now, this is a genre painting. A genre painting is uh, something that has to do with everyday life, whether it's uh, life of card players or life of the peasants or life of the fishmongers. That's genre painting, having to do with their preoccupation. So it is not... Uh, uh, classically elevated as uh, Poussin paintings were, but nevertheless it's uh, very close to one's heart and they were extremely popular in 17th century Flanders and Holland and, um, and found a ready market uh, for the painters of genre paintings. The, the presumably Louis, uh, Louis uh, Lenin, he's very famous for, for the paintings of these um, peasants. The one thing, however, we have to remember about them, they, they look very, very realistic and uh, they're extremely well drawn. The uh, fact, the sad fact, however, is that 17th century peasantry in France was horrifically miserable, uh, brutalized, really, uh, turned into beasts of, uh, of burden, whereas the uh, protagonists we see in, uh, in these paintings, they look more like prosperous, prosperous peasantry, of which uh, there weren't many. There were no middle classes in, um, in France at the time. So the question begs itself, what was, uh, what was the, uh, the purpose? over the paintings, because obviously the family, the, the peasant families couldn't buy them. Uh, the, um, and it seems that uh, there's so much dignity, there's never any derision, there's never any superciliousness in, in these paintings. Uh, these, these peasants sit there with the dignity of, uh, of kings, really, so, which is why the sociology be, behind those paintings is kind of absurd. They couldn't be looking like this. So the question begs itself whether what Lewis was really interested in 
was some some sort of a hybrid um, between the formalism of the classical tradition and genre painting. Because, as I said, genre painting was very popular in, in, in Flanders, in, in, in Holland, and it's right next to France, of course. Uh, and, and he was interested in it, but he clearly didn't want to paint peasants as they were, because that would be a very sorry sight, in fact. And uh, so he felt uh, he, he needed to strike a balance, which, which he did. And there's always this streak in French art from the Lenin brothers through Chardin in the 18th century and then, then Courbet in the 19th century and then on to Cézanne. There's always this um, streak of the, the love of order and simplicity, which goes, of course, hand, hand in hand with, with classicism and classical discipline. But there are these two streaks go hand in hand, and it's very possible that what the, this painter was interested in was just to the conveyance of integrity in anything that is honest, that is um, firm, enduring, and uh, whether it's a human heart or a, or a pot in, in a boy's hand, that worked. Because when you look at this painting, it's very, very formal. It is extremely symmetrical. Right here, in the middle, there's a woman with her spinning, and on each side, and then it's almost as if she's come. This is a, it's almost a holy family. It becomes a holy family. There's, there she is. There is a child on her left. There's a considerably older man on her right, and one begins to think of a holy family, and also the sort of rough, Raphaelite way of doing the incredible symmetry and then some Caravaggesque influences right there with the light falling on the girl's face. The, it's beautiful, and, and the, the folds, the folds on this tablecloth, they're almost Leonardo-esque. And uh, here is another one, again attributed to Louis, because presumably Louis was the great painter. And, um, and, 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 and here, the, the, these stalks have the stability of undulating hills and uh, the girls and the boys. Here is another woman, here's another uh, Virgin Mary uh, sitting there with a baby in her lap looking over at us and it becomes a religious revelation in a sense. Uh, revelation through, as I said, through honesty, simplicity, um, endurance. And then we come to still another Frenchman. Now, this Frenchman presumably was born into a wealthy and, and somewhat aristocratic family, but he had a devil in his soul and just couldn't stay in one place uh, for a long time. And as such, the story goes that he runs away from his family at the age of 12 and joins a troupe of theatrical performers and uh, goes to Italy. Then somehow he gets back... Uh, to France, then Italy again, and on and on, and uh, all the while, no, not painting, he never painted, drawing all the while, he never used color. He, uh, I think he was apprenticed to a silversmith at one point, and he was a great printer and great draftsman, and as such, as I said, he never used color, but, uh, but his drawings are incredibly expressive, and, and have the fluidity of, uh, of a true virtuoso. He was, as you see, very interested in um, the life of the theatre, and the life of the theatre he often defect, uh, depicted. And here we have it. Commedia dell'arte originated in Italy sometime in the 16th century, an early form of professional theatre uh, originating in Italy, popular in Europe from the 16th to the 18th century. It was characterized by masks, uh, and the masks had types. So there were fixed social sorts and stock characters. Uh, foolish old men, uh, devious servants, uh, military uh, officers uh, who exhibited their bravado, always a pair of lovers. And uh, it actually it was Commedia dell'arte that first allowed women on stage. And it was with Commedia dell'arte that women became uh, actresses. Here's a pair of uh, these stock characters. And here's another one, the two pantaloons, sort of the, uh, the 
old men, greedy old men, and here they are performing. And as you see, he was incredibly fluent with his line. And uh, uh, I, I always repeat this saying of Leonardo that a great painting is when a significant emotion is given convincing mass, convincing line. And in, in, applica in the application of this phrase, uh, he certainly was uh, a brilliant performer. Now, these are the illustrations from the series called um, Le Gobi, and these are little dwarfs, little hunchbacks, and uh, he did very, very many of them. Uh, Le Gobi, various hunchback figures, the hunchbacks, and here, if you like, there's um, a theory where the idea of uh, them could have come from. Uh, what he, it, it comes from the journals of Ian Toll, Massachusetts-based playwright, actor, and mine. Was color drawing inspiration from an actual troupe of dwarf actors and musicians known as Lego B? Or are these sim simply figures from his imagination? Color was a child when Shakespeare composed The Merchant of Venice, believed to have been written sometime between 1596 and 98, and the first quarto published in 1600. And could the Gobi that Kalo illustrated have been the second generation of a troupe from which Shakespeare took the name Gobo in The Merchant of Venice? After all, the Commedia troops were often family businesses and some of them did travel to England. Not only does this tie in to my not very controversial intuition that links Shakespeare's Gobi with the Zani of the Italian comedy, in particular Arlecchino, but if any of the answers to the above questions are yes, then there's a strong argument to specifically cast dwarf actors in the roles of Lancelot and uh, old Gobo. So we don't really know where the term Le Gobi came from, but there are all sorts of uh, conjectures as to how it happened. And then he does something extraordinary. For a man who loves high life, uh, enthusiastic life, drinking, wenching, running around with troop actors, he does all uh, this running around, let's not forget, between France and Italy and Germany. And all of this is happening during the Thirty Year War that began in 1618 and will last until 1648. And this was uh, a series of wars in religion, horrific wars, in all the histories of wars, and that includes the First World War and the Second World War, the religious wars still count as some of the most horrific engagements in the history of mankind. Eight million perished in those 30 years from, uh, from savagery, from battles, plague, all of this was part of the Thirty Year War. And here he sketches, in fact, the miseries of war. Goya will be the next to do so. He, Kahlo, will be the first artist who, in fact, shows the brutality, the senselessness, the horror of, um, of war the um, impersonal cruelty of it, the victimization of the innocent, the brutalization of the guilty. Because until that, the war was always shown as a noble adventure, as something that certainly an aristocrat must do to distinguish himself, to be a hero, to, uh, to prove his honor, to prove his dignity. So it was always shown in these uh, very exaggerated forms of glory, whereas here is Kahlo who actually begins to show the, uh, the real horse. And, uh, and, and here it is. Um, and in all these drawings, his ease of drawing, because as I said, he, uh, he was a brilliant draftsman, well, that was the matter of his hand, but the accuracy with which he drew, he drew that was the matter of his eye. And, uh, and it appears that the specialists, in fact, can, um, 
can recognize the types of swords or muskets or, uh, or various firearms that were used at the time and because everything is drawn with incredible precision. It's drawn with an objective eye of a reporter and these scenes of devastation and violence and horror we can we know that he is showing us what actually went on during those horrible wars of religion. And it is sobering to remember that all of the they took place mostly on the German territory, just as the First World War devastated Fr France uh, with its trenches. Uh, the religious wars absolutely devastated Germany, and it's sort of it's sobering to think that it was at the same time that. Uh, Poussin was constructing his classical brilliant landscapes in uh, Rome and Rubens was drawing in Antwerp and traveling between the between royal courts. So here is one example and you'll, see, you'll be able to see it a lot better in your PowerPoints. You can also uh, look up, look him up. Thirty Years War, here it is, religious conflict, uh, primary uh, fought in Central Europe, remains one of the longest and most brutal wars in human history with more than 8 million casualties, resulting from military battles, wholesale ex executions, as you see here, from famine, disease, diseased, caused by the conflict. And uh, these are just more of the same. And, uh, and here too, I know it's very difficult to see them on, um, on, on a small screen, but as I said, if you, if you look up uh, Kalo, you'll be able to see it. And our last but not least painter is also a Frenchman. We covered France today. And his name is Georges de Latour. And as uh, you see in his paintings, probably immediately, he was considerably influenced by Caravaggio. How could he not be when he paints like that? He is obviously interested in one source of light, that source of light being a candle. And uh, he paints religious scenes which he calls religion scene, the religious scenes, but he just, in this case, paints a carpenter in his shop with a little boy looking at him, but of course giving it the name of uh, Saint Joseph implies immediately that this is Christ's child and his father, and thus gives uh, the painting the depth of religious mystery, whereas Georges de Latour was really interested in the mystery of light and uh, as as a single candle is lit in the darkness and all the gradations of light and uh, shadow as uh, it penetrates the darkness and reflects on the faces of uh, the father and the son and the, because the light is so close to the boy's face it is essentially discolored meanwhile it's a, because also look at the hand of the boy you can, you can see the light through the hand and then he also protects, protects it from the father's face and as a result the father's sort of wrinkled face becomes revealed as through the mystery of, of light and uh, the mystery of faith. They're very compelling, these, um, these paintings. Uh, there's also this very palpable air of stillness about them that of course only adds to the mystery. Um, this is, he paints a woman with a skull, calls her the Repentant Magdalene. He painted many of these um, variations on the same theme. And this, it's a woman in, um, in her underclothes, uh, again, with one uh, candle, and the candle lights the canvas from the back. And from, so we are watching it, we're watching the effects of the candle. We only see the profile of, uh, of a skull and uh, we are watching as the light penetrates her sleeve and then uh, becomes uh, lighter and lighter and brighter and brighter until it in fact discolors the sleeve and, uh, and the woman's face, it's turned away from us at, at about three-quarter angle and very contemplative and again the air of stillness is very much there while the rest of the painting is steeped in this dark shadow. Very courageous but, uh, but with a different uh, intent there whereas with Caravaggio it was all very dramatic. I mean the drama is here as well but it's uh, more of a contemplative drama. And then with time his tendency 
led him more and more towards uh, geometry and abstraction. So if, uh, if the earlier canvases, as we saw with that light source, uh, looked almost metaphysical and contemplative, so from there, I suppose, was uh, an easier bridge to the geometric uh, abstraction that, uh, that, is, that is so compelling to our eyes, to modern eyes. And here, we don't see the candle here at all, but we presume it's there. We don't see it. Uh, there are one, two, three, there are three young men, one older man, and uh, one woman. And, uh, but again, the uh, structure of the painting is very, very almost classical. It's very, very symmetrical. Uh, it's all in the foreground. Uh, there is no background, so we are in a very baroque space in terms of crowdness. And uh, the dice, here they are, the dice players, you see the dice, and the only, your only indication of the candle and where the candle is, is this reflected light on a very polished table, and also the light reflects then on the faces of the players and on, uh, on their armor. Very compelling, Georges de Latour. And thus we have covered um, the French painters, uh, majority of whom, as I said, certainly Poussin and, uh, and Claude lived in Italy most of their lives. And this is French Baroque, which will be very, very important and very, very influential. And uh, next time we'll go to Holland and uh, start looking at Rembrandt. And I will see you next week.